Hello everybody, we're here today to talk to Nicholas Cope, who is an author, a speaker on many subjects and also an artist. And today we're going to start off talking about Napa Power, which is in Scotland. So um, I know you do tours to them as well, but if we could start off with explaining what Napa Power is, please, Nick, and welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Um, it's really good to be invited on your show. It's fabulous. Um, yeah, Napa Power is um, a Neolithic dwelling on Papa Westre, which is one of the remotest islands of Orkney. Um, what I mean by Neolithic is, is that it's very, very old. It's about, it's more than three and a half thousand BC. So it's, you're looking at something five and a half to six thousand years old. And it's just about the oldest, oldest um, standing dwelling in virtually in the world, certainly in Europe. Um, by standing dwelling, I mean that it still has intact walls, almost to the height they were originally. So, um, and I've studied this place since 1994 when I first went there. Um, and it's, it's one of these places where you, you can go there, but unless you kind of, if you don't pick up anything or if you don't, if you're not interested in the place, it's just like an old dwelling, a stony dwelling that you can just leave and never think of again. But, you know, I had particular experiences there and um, I was there for like three or four days in 1994 and um, I've written a book on it. Um, so I'm considered an expert on Napa Power now, which is a bit bizarre. <laughs> What's your book called? But it's called The uh, Napa Power and the Origins of Geometry. I've got one here. Um, that's the book there. And it's you'll big... see that... Um, sorry? Back a bit. Just back a little bit. Can't quite see okay, it. That's can you it. See the whole thing now. There you go. It's only a thin book, but like there's a lot of dense information in there. And I collaborated with um, Keith Critchlow, Professor Keith Critchlow. He 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 asked me because I told him about my work on the Napa Power, and he was so interested because it involves quite complex geometry and Pythagorean geometry, and Platonic ideas and things like this. So he asked me to collaborate with him on a book. Which so is it took about he's three years. In. That's sorry, something sorry. he's interested in, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Well. I mean, he's one of the... I mean, there are a lot of us who are pupils of Keith's. I was a pupil of his... Well, actually, going back to 1983, when I first met him on my degree course. But uh, more recently, well, not really recently, but in 89, 1991, I was at the Royal College of Art. He was the director of the course. So, and I didn't do the painting course. It was uh, Vita visual islamic and traditional arts traditional arts and i basically studied um traditional forms of geometry so um and i will kind of explain what i mean by that um as we kind of talk really because there's a lot of geometry in the architecture of an app of Hauer. there's golden means there's there's three four five pythagorean triangles and there's all sorts of things going on there and it's it's a very strange place because you know, we, we, we visit these places and they're just like, either they're a pile of stones or it's a stone circle. And, and I don't believe they are as they were, you know, because pe this, this has been like deserted for five and a half thousand years, 5,000 years. Um, and who knows what it was like and what was going on in these places. We're told that the Napa flowers are dwelling, but that's because they don't know. <laughs> they have no idea. The archaeologists have no idea what the use was. But I mean, there's certain things going on there with the uh, proportions and the geometry that give, give a sign that it's not just a dwelling, there's things going on there. And it's way beyond any coincidence. And it was only so, recently um, discovered, really, wasn't it? it hasn't it been under? Yeah, I story? think, um, yeah, uh, 1919, 1920. It's the same story as um, Scarra Bray, also in Orkney, a different island, but it's also in Orkney. And there was a storm one night, uh, which exposed a few stones. So the landowner, the landowner comes along with his shovel and finds like built walls under the sand because it was covered in sand dunes. And all it took was a big storm to blow it away and a bit of erosion on the, the coastline. And suddenly, you know, but it wasn't really until the 70s and 80s until it was properly excavated. And, and I, I've worked from the, the archaeologist's drawing from, from her archaeological report which i think she did in 1983 so that's really recent mm -hmm. uh, com compared to the fact that it was uncovered in around about 1920 
something like that. So, but I mean, it's an amazing place. And the person who discovered it had no idea what it was. They just found a few stones. But um, in later years, they found that it was actually two dwellings, two buildings connected by a passage. And um, yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of work on this passage and the arrangement of the architecture and the proportions between them. And th there's more going on than just a building. <laughs> it's a particular kind of building, but I, I can't say what that is um, because I don't think we'll ever know, but um, certain things give signs as to what may have been going on there. Because it is a different shape to, to buildings that we're used to, or even that the... Yeah, it's, it's totally to unique. It's completely unique. I'll show you um, a ground plan. It's actually my version of the ground plan. Sorry, it's over my face, sorry. <laughs> this is the right, Napa Power. Can, can you see that? This we is the larger that. building, and this is the smaller building, and this is the passage between the two. And you can see that this building has two rooms. There's one room here and another room there. And this building has one, three rooms, one, two, three. Um, it's divided by the upright partitions. Um, interestingly, if you put an axis up the center of each of the structures, um, they're completely parallel. So that they're, they're meant to be designed together and, and you know, they look like they're randomly placed. Mm -hmm. but they're not randomly placed at all. There's a particular geometric rotation that, sorry, I'm poking around the side here now. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, in order for the, the, the smaller building to be where it is, relies on a particular geometric rotation from the larger building. So it's, I mean, there's, it's hard to kind of delve straight into it. I normally kind of start with like smaller things and then build up to that. But essentially, my, my, what, I've dis, what I feel I've discovered is that this is a mother and this is her child. And if you look at the way they're standing together or lying together even, it's, it's, it's really quite sensitive, the way they're not encroaching on each other's space. They're kind of, um, they're with each other. It's like they're, they're just touching hands. Um, the buildings aren't actually joined either. They're completely separate buildings that supposedly they were built by the same or the next generation. This was the first one and the smaller one was built after, but only 20 or so years after. So the same people would have known them. Um, um, and there's, the you know, the insides the, are quite interesting, aren't they? The insides of yes. the shape of the rooms even. Well, the, the, I mean, I think this being a child, you can see that there's an abdomen here mm -hmm. and you can see that the thoracic area has a fireplace, which is the heart, the hearth of the building. And this actually does look like a head. It has compartments which you could think of as being a brain or some storage. Obviously, that was stored. Things were stored there. Um, so, I mean, this to me is a is a human child. Doesn't matter if it's male or female. It's a human child. That's the thing. And this is a mother. And you, you might think that the mother doesn't have a head. Head. Um, but actually, it still has a dome at the top. And actually, you know, the equivalent, um, there's equivalent um, statuettes from the Mediterranean. I mean, going back 30 or 40 or 50,000 years, um, some of the more recent ones uh, around this time don't actually have heads. So for some reason, the mother goddesses, it's not necessarily for them to have a head, which I find quite interesting. Sometimes they had a depression between the shoulders and um, did, the heads were removable. So depending on the purpose, what they were used for, particular heads can be put on them, which I find quite interesting. So yeah. the fact that there may not be a head with this doesn't matter at all. Um, but also the, the reason why I think this is the child and this is the mother is that this building fits exactly inside this building. So it's like symbolically the child has come from within the mother, which is in fact what happens. <laughs> we all know that and there's a particular I can't really go into the particular geometry of the rotation but the child can only be in this situation and you, I always wondered what this gap between the two buildings was here uh, I mean these are walls so it's a completely useless space um, um, but you know, the buildings had to be this shape and the building ha buildings had to be where they are, which resulted in this space. 
that's why that space is there. It may have had a practical function as well, but there's no way we'll know that. Um, I mean, nowadays we would store our ladders and things in it, but you know, who knows what it was used for? It's just mm -hmm. a space. There's a consequence of the geometry, really. Um, I'm wondering if they don't have heads on the mothers because it's the body that's obviously giving birth, but every woman can be a mother, so there's no need to be a I head. think so. I think it might mean that it's more of a universal thing. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. I think maybe what these Greek, um, well, the Mediterranean mother goddess figurines are alluding to is the principle of femininity or motherhood. And so, you know, the head is not really... Uh, the head, in a way, is an individualistic way of looking at something. They have a face, which is only their face. So if, if you don't either don't have a head, or I think there's, um, there's a couple of them which have been found, which are actually very old, that have kind of like ropes around like a ball on the, It's definitely not a face. So, I mean, that kind of goes along with the fact that there's no head on the lap of our mother. Mm. Um, you know, so um, the fact that the, the child is has three sections in the body, the same as the human torso, I found fascinating that, I mean, this, this room here, that's definitely an abdomen, isn't it? And so if you think this is the abdomen and this would be the equivalent abdomen of the mother, what is it that connects a, a mother and child you know, before birth and immediately after birth? Mm -hmm. The umbilical cord. So this is what I call the passage. I call it the umbilical passage because it is the only direct communication between the mother and the child. And um, there's other things I've found more recently since the book's been published. I've found particular crystals on the stones. Uh, actually, the first time it was found, it wasn't found by me. It was found somebody that I was with. Um, so I can't claim that I found them. Um, but I've done a lot of work on it. And um, the crystals themselves are in interesting positions within the buildings, specifically one. So am I talking too much? <laughs> no, keep going. Because these aren't crystals uh, in the rock itself. These are crystals. Yeah, they're on the, the face rock. of the stones and they only occur three times yeah. in the whole of the two structures. And the first one I was shown is above, um, is the lintel above the passage. As you're, as you're entering the passage between the two structures from the mother, the larger building, into the passage, eventually going to come out into the smaller building. But it's just above you as you enter the passage. And I mean, it's interesting that, you know, quartz, these are cloudy quartz crystals or milky quartz crystals, one of the two. Um, these have always been used for, in, uh, for aids for transformation. So, you know, the fact that I'm saying that the child was born from the mother and birth is a transformation. So maybe this was used in some ritual or it could have even been a birthing house that the, in the mother larger building, the mother may have prepared herself and birth was actually taken place in the smaller structure. And so the, the meaning of going under this lintel, which is faced with crystals, um, could, could aid some kind of transformation. Or it could be some sort of much more shamanic thing. It might not necessarily be a practical birthing place. It could be a shamanic practice for transformation for more spiritual reasons. Mm. Um, Okay, so the locations of these crystals are quite important because, um, well, this, this drawing here, I'm, I'm sorry this is quite amateurish, but there's no other way I can do it. Unless you buy my book, of course, it's of got course. it all in the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, where, where, where I've got the two axes going up, like a spine of a human being, um, the, these points here are very important where it enters the structures and the point that the buildings touch is a golden mean between the two entrances mm -hmm. so if this is one this would be 1.618 dot 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 it'll go on forever um, and where the crystals are so I showed you completely the wrong drawing this is where the buildings touch 
which is the golden mean between here and here. Mm -hmm. This is the entrance to the passage from the larger building. And you can see it's also a golden mean. So that line there is where the crystals are, the first kind of crystals. And they're in the, in the doorway as they walk in. They're above the doorway. I've got a picture here. So this is a mirror image. This is the doorway where the crystals are. Mm -hmm. And this is the point that the buildings touch and they mirror each other between the centers of each doorways. Now this is looking at, you're inside the mother, right. looking into the passage now. And it's this second lintel above, which in black and white, you can't really see very clearly, but there are loads of crystals all, all embedded on the face of the stone there. I have some color pictures. You'll like this one. This is a close up of some of the crystals. This is actually hey, hold about... It, hold it still for a moment because otherwise it's all shaky. Yeah, this is actually about three or four inches wide, wide. And that's one block of crystals. Oh, and then there's more there's there's four lots i mean this is on one stone so you can see that the crystals are here here and here and all along here and they're quite clearly crystals i mean that they're definitely crystals and you can see the color of them i mean i would like to know if anybody knows exactly what kind of quartz that is I think it's either a cloudy or a milky quartz that may be the same kind of quartz. And, you know, I've been through ideas thinking, oh, well, maybe, you know, that, that, that these crystals have occurred since the building has been built. But, you know, you read up on these crystals and these are formed deep underground in intense heat and intense pressure. So there's no, these stones were chosen to be in these particular locations for a specific reason and they conform to the geometry of the architecture as well. Are the stones uh, from that area? All the stones are from the area, yeah. The, the, the natural, the way the stone splits is horizontally. So it naturally splits on the beaches and you can see it on the beaches and everywhere. The stones naturally split into slabs, but they don't always naturally split with crystals. Um, so maybe this was artificially split because you could see there were crystals there and that, that piece was specifically used. It's no random coincidence that these crystals are in that location. Um, and crystals obviously give off some kind of energy. We can feel the differences in them throughout the well, day. Yeah, some people can feel things like that. I, I'm not particularly someone who's sensitive to that myself, but I kind of do other things. <laughs> but, um, well, as far as I know, anyway. Um, um, but yes, I mean, I think, I think perhaps when this building was in use, um, certainly these crystals were used and they were crucial in what the building is. And there are crystals in the, I mean, a couple of years after that, that was only in 2017, I found the crystals above the doorway. So you're looking at um, 25 years since I first went there. So this work I'm doing on the Napa Fowl is quite ongoing. Um, and there are new things I discover that all, all the time. Um, one of them is that there are more crystals I discovered last August in the smaller structure. Now this is, and they're in also in interesting positions. So I don't know if you can make any sense of this. This is the smaller structure. This is the entrance of the passage from the mother. mother. So the mother's over here, the other side. Um, one set of stone, one stone is here. Mm -hmm. This is the main doorway to the, the smaller child building. And the, the crystal stone is to the, to the right hand side of it again. Now they're both at the same height and they're both to the right hand side of the stones, of the entrances, sorry. So I, I, I don't know why, <laughs> but I, I would imagine that it's, it's to do with, like you said, some kind of energy, energy. I don't know what kind of energy, or maybe it's some kind of, they had, maybe the people who lived here or built it would have hands, had some knowledge of what we would call Feng Shui now. Um, you know, um, maybe the whole building was orientated around the fact that these crystals have to be in those particular places. 
I do know that in Feng Shui, crystals are quite often placed beside doorways yes. to aid the energy coming in or the, the free movement of whatever that, that's coming in. Um, so it could be that, um, that the builders five, 6,000 years ago were well aware of these things, which, which kind of I believe is the case. Well, that's also um, the heart know. side the uh, doors are in. if you're walking in from both sides that would be on yeah, your the, heart side that's right be cleansing yeah, yeah. It. because yeah, crystals yeah. don't just give out energy they also take take energy they absorb they? energy yes. right okay well it's interesting that you know, I, I feel that um and i've never felt it myself but by looking at the ground plan of this place i'm scrappling around for another drawing now <laughs> Um, if you enter this building here, um, there is almost kind of a spiral and I have put a golden mean spiral over this area here and it does fit really well. So in a way you could be walking from here and then suddenly there's, um, where would the, um, the crystal would be to the left hand side, it would be just here and it would maybe draw you round in a circular spiral movement in, within the abdomen for what purpose that had, I have no idea. But, so whoever um, built these knew sacred geometry. Oh, the, the, without a doubt, they were well aware of uh, the golden mean, mean um, Pythagorean triangles. Now, Pythagorean triangles, we know from Pythagoras, obviously, which is a three, four, five triangle. Um, you couldn't have constructed this place without a three, four, five triangle because it's one of the simplest ways to construct a golden mean point between two extremes. I, I won't go into the geometry now. It's, it's actually very simple, but I can't do it with my hands. Um, <laughs> and they would have drawn it out on sand and they would have used stones and ropes. They had ropes and they had string. We know they did. Um, we know they did because there were cod bones found in Apophawa. Now, that, you might think, well, what's that got to do with it? And I thought that. I was, but then when I put two and two together, it made complete sense. You, because we know that they had this cod. Um, now, you can't trade cod. I mean, it goes off in a day. They didn't have freezers, you know. So you'd ha they'd have to have been locally caught. Now, cod are only caught in, in what we would consider deep water. That's at least 20 metres of water. And they can only be caught in this context with hook and line from a seafaring boat. So based on the fact that we found cod bones, of a, of a, these are large cod, these are six, seven foot long cod. They would have caught them from seafaring boats, uh, at least a mile offshore, using hooks and lines. <laughs> so they would, have had, <laughs> they would have had ropes, they would have had strings, so they would have been able to mark out any kind of geometry. And I think maybe even at Scara Bray, some Neolithic rope was found. Um, not quite as old as Napafawa, because Napafawa is three or 400 years older than Scara Bray. It's much older than anything, virtually anything in Britain, um, which makes it very interesting. And um, <laughs> could it on the island, is it um, looking over the sea? sea? Is well, it, it is now, it's right, it's right on the coast now, but at five, 6,000 years ago, the sea level was lower, and so it would have been uh, overlooking like a bay or an inlet um, between two islands, and you would have been able to wade across to Westray, which is the local bigger island, slightly larger than Papa Westray. Um, you know, you would have waded through um, basically where they would have got a lot of their food from. They would have eaten a lot of shellfish. In fact, there was a quern. There's a quern, I don't know if you know what a quern is, it's a big grinding stone and it's, it's a saddle quern. So you sit over it like it's a saddle between your legs and you have a big grinding stone like this. And this, this quern has worn down so much. It's worn down that much. And this big like hollow in the stone. And when it was excavated, they found razor shell, um, grindings from razor shells all around it, which presumably that was the last, purpose it was used for was grinding razor shells and they would have got the razor shells from the bay it would have been it sounds lovely <laughs> i'd love to have lived there then um and what they would have done is that they would have added it to their food they would have had a form of bread because they had cattle and sheep these bones have been found domesticated cattle and sheep 
So they would have added it to food. I mean, they would have had some kind of bread um, and it would have ground down their teeth because it's slightly abrasive. And we look at, you know, other people's teeth who are not Westerners and, and you see that they have ground down teeth and you think, oh, that must have been awful for them. You know, but actually they had a very, very good diet and they added razor shells to their food because it's extremely high in calcium. So that they knew they knew all this, and um, and it was just literally a few hundred yards from where they lived. They could just and go and forage. I wanted to ask: Are the rooms quite rooms quite height wise? Is it for for small people, or is it normal sized humans? Perhaps if it was humans. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the height of the, the walls are about six feet, maybe seven feet, um, and it's supposed that because there are no other stones found. Um, some have been robbed away. The, 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 the lowest wall, I think, is four feet high, five feet maybe, and the tallest one is six and a half feet, something like that. And that is, a, well, the archaeologists tell us that that is the, the, what they expect the height of the walls to have been, because um, you could have certainly stood up in the buildings. It would have had a roof. Um, it's, it's up for debate what the roof was made of. There were post holes been found. Um, three or four in each building so we know that that would have supported a roof um, they're in a triangular format in the in the ground um, maybe about a foot across these post holes but of course wood has always been relatively scarce on Orkney even then and the amount of wood that would have been needed for domestic use would have destroyed all the woodlands but I, I feel there was no woodland and this is perhaps it would have been either driftwood uh, which would have been very valuable, or it would have been whale bone, because other uh, bones from whales have been found. Um, they didn't just domesticate pigs, sheep, and cattle, but they found seals, deer, and whale bones. So it's possible they could have used whale bones as the uprights. Um, I like to think of them being decorated and carved, even. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Who knows? Nice. Who knows? I mean, we, I, I try not to get into too much fantasy, <laughs> but I, I don't see why not. I, I really don't see why not. But there's no, um, no human bones have ever been found. There's no burials nearby. No, not in the, the actual dwellings themselves. Um, there was a cow found, cow found um, right next to one of the buildings, which was basically a whole cow well, was put under the ground. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for what purpose? I have no idea. It was like burying a cow outside your front door. We wouldn't do that now. But an entire cow was buried, just, and they found this entire cow's bone, um, cattle skeleton, completely intact. Like it hadn't just died thousands of years later and got buried. It was buried at the time. So that's quite interesting. And in many um, religions, cows are seen as very sacred, linked to the mother. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look in India, you, you can't shush them off the road or anything <laughs> um, <laughs> they're very sacred things well i mean everything is sacred isn't it <laughs> everything of nature is sacred <laughs> there's nothing that's any less sacred than anything else and another <laughs> sacred object is the egg and you were saying that you found an egg anom anomaly well yeah there's um at the point where the buildings touch from the outside you can see there's a very interesting kind of it's again it's like a, a wasted space this space here is wasted this space here is wasted in practical terms um so what's going on here this is pointing to me this is an arrow pointing to the golden mean point you see <laughs> this two lines you see what i mean yeah it's, it is actually an arrow pointing exactly to that point and on this point here hang on let me see where it is yes it's on the small building very close to that I have to look for some more drawings now, some photos. Um, these drawings are in your book as well though, aren't they? They're, everything's in my, actually the crystals and these eggs aren't because this is stuff I've found since the book was published in 2016. You need a revised and updated uh, Yeah, edition. I'm kind of expanding some of the chapters. Um, in fact, um, do you know Lawrence Main, the Lay Hunters Journal? Oh, yes. Um, I'll show you the last one. That's his last one. I've actually written an article for the next one, which I think is out in a month or so. Um, um, 
about uh, the mother and child and the relationship between them, um, the headless mother, and I've talked about it. I've talked about these crystals, but only the ones above the lintel, these ones above the passageway. When I wrote that, which was a year or so ago, I hadn't actually found the other crystals. I only found them when I was there last August. So, um, look for the right images to show you now. So, yeah, there's this stone. I mean, I would be interested if anybody has any opinions about this. I'm not thoroughly convinced it's man-made because this shape here, it's very regular. Um, and if it's some sort of erosion, there's no other erosion on this part of the wall. I mean, was this stone used, was it chosen for that particular point? Because the golden mean point is, is just off the photo here. Um, and it's in the stones that are pointing towards that area. So, you know, I'd be interested to know if anybody has any idea what this is. And this isn't the only occasion it occurs at Napa Power as well. It occurs on two other occasions, one of which is on the corner of a stone. I haven't got any photos of that because it's very difficult to see. Both of them actually on the edges of stones. So it's almost like um, they've been carved they've been used for a purpose, and that purpose has then been forgotten, the stones have been broken, broken, uh, maybe on purpose, maybe accidentally, this one here isn't, the one I've shown you isn't broken, and then maybe they were um, put into the building for a specific reason, because someone remembers their great granddad using these stones for, for a reason, who knows, you know, we, we just have no idea, but um, some of the, it, it occurs in the head of the child and also in the just in the inside the main doorway of the larger building larger building of the mother building um so there's quite a few fertility symbols possibly the egg the cow I, I, being I, it could be fertility symbols but i always think it's a bit more than that that um forgive me but i that's always i always think when someone talks about fertility that's always quite vague i think these people knew what they were doing. Uh, fertility is, is such a big thing um, that they knew specifically what these stones, and these stones had a specific purpose and they were placed in specific positions for, for that specific purpose. Mm -hmm. So um, it may have been to do with fertility, but you know, you could say anything is, you could say a big standing stone is, fer is fertility because it's phallic, you know. Um, I, who knows? Who knows? There's but no, all I, I know is that th oh, these are these things, the crystals and the egg anomalies, <laughs> um, are in specific positions, which, which to me is very interesting, and, and everything relates to the geometry. And there's no other building like it that we know of in the world. There's there? nothing we know of that's similar to Napa Power. There have been other buildings found of, that were around the same time. There was one found um, 10, 15 years ago that was excavated uh, at Smirkoy Farm on the mainland of Orkney. Um, but it was only one building, one building. And it was, it, was, it was very similar to the larger building of Napa Power, but there was no other building with it. So uh, it was a very similar structure, but the walls were only a foot or so high. Um, it was in a field, it wasn't right by the sea. And, I mean, the Napa Power has been very lucky because it was disused by about 2800 BC and it was covered in sand for all that time. Nearly 5,000 years it's been covered in sand until 1919 when it was uncovered. So it's been uncovered at this, re at this time, roughly 100 years ago, just over. Um, maybe so it can be interpreted so people can gain something from it. Who knows? Yeah, especially in these interesting times we live in at the moment. Because it They're is spring equinox today, the day we're recording this, it's spring equinox, but it's like an ice age out there, it's freezing cold today. It is very cold today, yeah. <laughs> well, but it's know... the first day that's, that's actually not wet. Yes. <laughs> that that's what makes a big difference. <laughs> but we don't know who these people were, do we? Well, it's interesting, I've been looking at the people because I'd quite like to write something about the people. Because I think a lot of the, you know, if, if they're using sacred geometry, um, the people don't make this up themselves. They inherit it from other people. Um, 
so, and we know there are certain phases of Neolithic uh, life and building in Orkney, and this is the earliest. Um, there are many more places like the Ring of Brodgar, they're actually a bit later. They're actually a few hundred years later. They're, they're more 2,700, 700, 2,800. I mean, a good seven, 800 years after this place was, was built and maybe 100 or 200 years after it became disused. So the people that built Ness of Brodgar, um, Ring of Brodgar and the Ness of Brodgar, but that's something else, um, may not have even been aware of Napa Power, but the, the ideas would have continued. That's what's interesting. The, um, Maze Howe, which is again, it's a slightly later, still Neolithic. Um, you walk in there and it's almost Egyptian. The way that the, the the way the stones fit together, um, and apparently that was a completely different set of people that built that than built Map of Hower, because it was you know it's many hundreds of years later. So I mean, if you think the time between um, Nap of Hower and the Ness of Brodgar, or the Nap or um, what's the the burial of Maid Chamber I've just mentioned I've forgotten its name, Maze Howe. Um, is the same distance between us and you know the dark ages right. a long time <laughs> the same distance you know 13 1400 years and where's um, Maze Howe? is that on the same island Maze Howe is on the mainland of orkney right. okay um and it's it's an amazing place if you ever get to orkney you can go on a little tour and go on a trip they don't let, when i first went there i managed to get in on my own and it wasn't open, you had to pick up a key, cup of key, and that was in 94, but now you have to go and pay money and you have to go on a little bus and you're taken on a tour and you don't really get any time on your own in these places. So it's, it's very different now, but... Okay. Um, well, the reason I ask is because you said Maze Howe was a bit Egyptian-like and I have got on my YouTube channel a little film that I made about whether the Egyptians came to Scotland and whether Scotland is... Well, well whether yeah. the Egyptians came to Britain and it's got a big bit about Scotland in there. So oh, that's interesting. To check that yeah. out some more. Okay, I'll have to look at that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I say it's Egyptian, but not in its style or the form of it, but in the, in the, in the, the way it's so intricately put together. Yes. Um, you know, if and they did come here, they wouldn't have erected big temples and pyramids. They would have done what they could. Well, they what may they have do? put, they may have built burial things, and mm. you know, if people came here, they would have had people here that died. So um, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. I, I haven't looked into that myself, but <laughs> it's a possibility. <laughs> we were so talking earlier about uh, ge uh, sacred geometry, and of course, you're very interested in the Platonic solids, and. Mm. You yourself have been doing some art with platonic solids, so I wondered if you wanted to discuss that a little bit. Oh, well, I haven't really been making art. I've been making these. Platonic <laughs> solids. <laughs> Which, um, I mean, there's, there's evidence that the um, builders of Napa Power were aware of platonic solids because um, one stone in particular, this is a copy I bought at the Ness of Brodgar. The Ness of Brodgar is basically a very old temple complex. It goes back to almost the age of Napa Power to about nearly three and a half thousand BC. And this, this was found in one of the, the structures. And it was slightly damaged on one side, but this is an exact copy of what they think it looked like originally. And it doesn't conform to the platonic solids. There's five platonic solids that were discovered or, you know, found by Plato. Um, um, but this doesn't, but I find it quite interesting in that, you know, it's a perfect size to hold in your hand and it has a two side and a three side and a four side. So depending on which way you hold it, you know, you can hold the four on your hand, which exposes the two. You can have three on your hand, which exposes three on the top. And if you have two on your hand, then you just have one on top. So I, I think these were used, I don't think they were used for the maths, the way we think of it, but they, they were used basically to teach people the nature of the universe, which um, is geometric. <laughs> it's, it's full of the geometric harmonies um, and proportions and ratios that Plato and Pythagoras talked about thousands of years ago. And I believe that the people at Napa Power were, was also a flowering of that wisdom as well. 
Um, if, if there was Pythagorean triangles in the Napa Power, then they would, they would have known about the wider Platonic or Pythagorean ideas. I believe they would have. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like the medieval time perhaps was a flowering of that um, due to certain books being really published by the, um, the Arabs. Um, you know, perhaps the Egyptians were a flowering of that. Perhaps ancient Greek was, Greece was, but perhaps the Neolithic in Orkney was as well. Mm -hmm. But because there's so little remaining, they obviously didn't have paper. Um, you know, the archaeologists aren't going to go as far as claiming that, are they? <laughs> but when you get objects like this, which, and this is made from stone. Now, the only, some of these stones are made from granite, but this isn't, this is a softer stone. But even so, they didn't have metal. This is a good thousand years before metal came to these islands. And they would have only had other stones to carve them. Some of these things would have taken them months and months and months. One of the most famous is the Taui stone. And this is a copy of it, slightly too large. It should be a little bit smaller. Um, it, should be it should be between these sizes somehow. Although I've never seen this one. It's in a museum in Scotland, which I'm ashamed I haven't been to see it, but I will one day. I'm not sure which museum in Aberdeen, Aberdeen uh, Museum, I think. Um, um, but this is a tetrahedron. It's a platonic solid. Um, and it's a tetrahedron, which basically is a pyramid with three sides. So you've got one at the top, you've got one, two, three. Obviously a pyramid would have four. Um, so that's a tetrahedron. And that's quite intricate. I, I, I suppose that this is slightly later. No one can interpret any of these markings. I mean, look how incredible that is. And obviously this is very similar to things we see at New Grange in Ireland. Because well, they are the swirls, aren't they? It's the swirls and spirals and weird kind of notches and things in this here. So um, this meant something again to these people. It, it wasn't anything vague. It was something specific that it meant to them. This was a language they understood. You know, they absolutely understood. We've lost all knowledge of that. Yes, that we language. have. I, I myself so, wonder if it's them trying to uh, uh, show energies, maybe. Well, it's possible. Know. Yeah, it's very possible. I mean, I, I tend to think, I, I, I always go for the most extreme. Maybe that's me. And I always think that this is meant to represent something non-physical. Um, what, what I mean by that, it's meant to mean something metaphysical. Um, so it's something that's beyond nature, and which is our source and our origin. So this describes the nature of universe, where we come from, where we are and where we're going to. That's, that's what these things represent to me. And I, I, I can't believe that it wasn't anything like that. Although I could be wrong, who knows? Um, no, you know, I like that idea. I like to think that yeah. the ancients did know a lot more about the universe and how mm. it works and perhaps more in tune with it, you know, and that we're not in this day and age, sadly. Yeah. yeah, well, we've forgotten it, but we still have access to it. We still have Pythagoras' writings and we still have Pythag the, the Platonic stuff and we have all the, the medieval Arab stuff, Ibn Arabi and people like that and some Thomas Aquinas. They all had access to that. And you just look at the architecture of um, no, that's my phone. I'm not going to answer that now. You look at the architecture of the cathedrals in the medieval time, even Westminster Abbey and places like that. They they contain. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to turn that off. Got a nice <laughs> um, ringtone. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the best one. That's the oldest sounding one I could find. <laughs> Otherwise, they make me jump. Um, but yeah, I, th I think they had a flowering of this knowledge in Neolithic times in Orkney, um, absolutely. And the Ness of Brodgar is important because it's a recent archaeological site, maybe 15 years ago it was found, 20 years ago. And every year they excavate more and more and more and there are amazing buildings they found. They found one building which was basically the cathedral of the Neolithic world. And there was, this is way before Stonehenge. This is a good thousand years before Stonehenge. Um, and I'm talking about the ditch and bank at Stonehenge, which is oldest. The actual stones of Stonehenge are Bronze Age, the Bronze Age, most of them. Um, so, but this, this nest of Brodgar has um, 
a large building and the walls I think about five meters thick and they've been built outwards uh, um, into it's almost like a, a rounded square with a walkway a paved walkway all around the outside which is covered with with, with paving stones now that makes me think of ancient Greece you know and I can imagine them walking round this, I mean, like nowadays, it's all higgledy-piggledy, but at the time, it would have been immaculate. You know, we like to walk on, on steady floors now, and so did they then. We don't want to fall over, neither did they. <laughs> so they would have built it with as much skill as any builder nowadays, in fact, and probably more so. So the fact that they had these immaculate buildings with right angles uh, in stone, which, which is not really heard of in, in that part of the, the world at all. Um, it's, it's, the architecture is very similar to some of the architecture in Malta, and they're both contemporary. So almost certainly they had contact with the Mediterranean as well. Sardinia, Malta, places like that, mm -hmm. where there's other megalithic, neolithic sites, so of, of a comparable age. And yeah, similar building, building techniques as well. I think civilizations were more connected back in the ancient times on that kind of thing as well. I know um, they like to say in history that we were all divided, but I think we were actually, actually... Um, no, well, well I certainly attention. think if you go back to the Neolithic, two, three or 4,000 BC, I think the best way of, you know, we know they had seafaring boats because they, we saw the, we found these cod bones there. So if they had seafaring boats, which means they would have had to have gone a mile or two offshore, um, you know, who says they didn't communicate with larger boats yeah. um, to the Mediterranean? Because basically that's the, the best way of getting there. <laughs> you know, they didn't have aeroplanes and they wouldn't have walked that far. That would have been very dangerous. Um, that would have taken half a lifetime to walk to the Mediterranean, perhaps. It would have taken them years and years um, if they would have ever arrived. But getting on a boat, you know, if you're uh, an experienced seaman and it's your boat, you, you know how it works. You know, you might be in unfamiliar waters, but you're communicating with people who have similar ideas. I and mean, some of these temples on Malta have, have quite similar mother goddess forms. It's quite interesting. I kind of relate it to a lot of that. And it, they were built at exactly the same time. So who knows? Who knows? There's, there's so much with the Napa power. Um, I feel sometimes I've just started my work on it. <laughs> but like you said, I am expanding a lot of the work I've done. And, you know, ultimately I'm going to publish another book which will be a, a lot bigger. I mean, the book I've published already with Keith Critchlow, uh, it's, qu it's quite small. I've only written 10 or 12,000 words, but it's very dense. Um, you know, I've written a whole chapter about how the child building has these areas in the body and you can have an axis. And if you put the seven chakras, the, they correspond exactly to positions in the house. Like the hearth would be where the heart chakra is. The throat chakra is exactly where the, the head joins the, joins the thoracic area. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of correlations between all sorts of um, traditional and spiritual practices that are evidenced at Napa Vau from all over the world, whether it's um, feng shui or whether it's chakras. You know, I, I feel that these people were, in a way, this, had, had a more of a direct access to the source of all of this which we've now lost. And we've certainly lost in, it in our modern Western world. You know, we all have to hide away if there's a virus, <laughs> um, which rightly so, to be honest. Um, but, you know, it, the, the economy begins to collapse when, <laughs> when, when a few of us, well, most of us just spend time at home. It's very strange. Yeah. It shows how fragile we are. Yes, it does. And our culture, how fragile it is and how, how materialistic we are. You know, we, we don't think of anything other than what's beyond our noses, really, generally. Well, I kind of think that maybe this virus will make, that's happening now, will mm. make some kind of reset and make people, people change the way they are. And yeah. there'll be a real rethink of how life and... Oh, absolutely. Together. Certain people there will be. Absolutely mm. will be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it will absolutely do that. I mean, people have to really realise what's really important which is not their individuality. That's really kind of a more recent idea. You know, um, there's always been individuals, obviously, that's not what I mean. But the, the modern trend in the last few hundred years is 
is more of the me me idea you know i'm important you're not sort of thing but that's not how reality is that no. that's not the way it works <laughs> you know i Ooh, mean if, if, the nap of power, you know, if the nap of power was for anything it was to help people either going through a transition or to aid a transition uh, in many ways perhaps although we can't be really specific but these crystals give an idea of, of perhaps some idea of what was going on without being specific. So From the especially pictures you the, showed, they did look like smoky quartz to me. Smoky but, quartz, yeah. yeah I, 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 I thought it was smoky quartz. Yeah, mm. that's what I'm thinking. But I'm sure I, I mean, I would love to pick a bit off, but I, I haven't done that. <laughs> um, I, well, I wouldn't love to do that. I wouldn't guess <laughs> the way it is. But I, I would have thought that the whole of the face of that stone would have been covered in the, in the crystals because um, we're, looking at, um, we're looking at it now five and a half, six thousand years later. And obviously if the crystals are on the face of the stone, they would have come off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that would be an amazing have, um, sight. You know, so, sorry? That would be an amazing sight to see walking into a Well, door. it would have been amazing, especially yeah. the whole lintel. You can imagine it if it was freshly built. Mm. That would have been um, maybe even polished, who knows? But it would have been a, a stone maybe four foot across, four or five inches high. The whole face of that area would have been covered in crystals. All we're seeing now is the remnants of what's left. Mm. In fact, one of the stones, um, you can clearly see that there was more. I've got to look for it now. Here it is. Now, this is the only photo I have. I'm going to go back in August. Um, this is the stone to the right. This stone here, stone here, I think this has been filled in in more recent times, fill a gap, because actually this stone has corroded away a bit. And you can see, here, I don't know if you can see here, of some crystals. Okay, it's a bit hard to see because it's Yeah, so it's very hard to yeah. see. On, um, but they're right there. And I think this whole stone was, was one face crystal. Wow. And, and all, because the stone's corroded away, it's weathered away, um, this is all we've got that's left. Um, and when I was there, I was looking on the ground to see if any had fallen off the night before. But it's very <laughs> unlikely. Um, but no, I think the stones, it would have looked quite incredible. Um, and, and we don't know if even if the internal structure would have been stone, they could have had wall hangings. Mm. You know, they don't like being cold, just like we don't like being cold. So they would have insulated it somehow, even though the weather then was warmer. It was a lot warmer than it is now in Orkney. Um, people say to me, well, the, the low doorways, they're about three foot high. You have to crouch down to go inside. And the, the archaeologists think that was done because it was very windy outside. Well, it wasn't necessarily that windy. They're assuming that it's the same then as it is now. They haven't taken into account that actually it was a, it was a few degrees warmer. And the, the, the weather patterns would have been completely different. So I don't think you can guarantee that it would have been windy. No, all, I mean, it is windy most of the time in Orkney now. Um, but five, 6,000 years ago, who knows? Um, the, the low doorways may be for another reason. You know, bowing down to enter a building could be mm -hmm. a reason. Uh, they could be sacred buildings um, used for principles to do with motherhood, yeah. um, ritualistic transitions, um, accessing some spiritual knowledge. So, I mean, I, I don't go too far with explaining it <laughs> because we don't know. All we can do is talk about the evidence and um, discuss the consequences of what could, could have gone on there. And I, I feel that's kind of quite an interesting kind of line of thought, really. And you're going back there in August and you're giving a talk. Well, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, we, we, me and um, Megalithomania, uh, Hugh Newman, we're going to run another tour to August, we're in August to Orkney. Um, we've already got a couple of people. Um, I don't know how this, um, you know, a lot of them last year were Americans, so I don't think they'll be booking trips right now anyway. Maybe later in the summer they might. Summer they might. But um, yeah, absolutely. And the best way of doing that is to go on the Megalithomania website. Um, I don't know the name of it, but you can probably put it up afterwards. Yeah, it's megalithomania. Uh, yeah, and it's on their tour itinerary, uh, one of their tours, if you look at Orkney Tour. Mm -hmm. um, it's in August. Uh, I can't remember the dates. 
but it's in it's this coming august so last august it was fantastic trip we had a dozen or so people and it was me hugh and jj and we had a great time we went to some islands we got on some ferries with the vans and the minibuses and we all had a great time and i'm still in touch with most of the people from the tour as well they're, they're lovely people and, and i've made good friends well, the so kind of people that come on these tours are ones that are going to be interested, aren't they? So they're going to be exactly, like-minded people. Exactly, yeah. And we're talking here about Hugh Newman and JJ Ainsley. Ainsley, yeah, that's yeah, right. Ainsley. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Ainsley, Ainsworth, Ainsworth. Oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah, JJ. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I feel bad now. Ainsworth, I don't I think. actually know of that world. Yeah. I don't think it's Ainsley. <laughs> no, I don't think it is now, now you've said that. Anyway, yeah. it's definitely Hugh Ainsworth Newman and JJ. <laughs> You know, I've never said that word. I've never said her name. No, I've I... never said her surname. It's like, <laughs> when you see it, written down, you don't really know what it is until you see it, until you read it, until you read it. Say I'm it, sure rather. she'll forgive us. I'm sure she will. Yeah, she's we, we all just one. know her as JJ. <laughs> JJ, absolutely. Absolutely. We don't know. We don't need the surname. <laughs> but before that, you're going to be having an art exhibition in London. Well, um, yeah, I have had arranged... Um, an exhibition at St John's Church in Notting Hill, in one of the transepts, um, because I'm not just um, an author and a writer about you know weird subjects and Neolithic stuff, but I, I I'm, my my real thing is that I'm an artist. I'm a visual artist, and I've got an exhibition of recent work, but I, I'm not sure if it's actually going to happen 100%. Um, I suppose it's up to me, but I don't know if many people are going to be out and about in May. Um, I mean, it's not like it'll be a social thing. It'll just be up in a church and people can visit it. But, um, but maybe I'll you could just quickly explain what this moment. art is, because it's... it's, um, it's right, well, for years, yeah, I studied geometry for years um, and I did a lot of work, um, very complex work that was layered and would take me weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months and months and months. And so recently I've decided to... I wanted to do some work that was a lot quicker. And so since October, November actually, I think I've come up with about 85 or 90, 90 artworks. And I, I, do them on, um, I do them with photographs, my own photographs, and I superimpose my old geometric drawings and paintings over the top. Now it sounds a bit bizarre, um, but I will show you an example if you give me a second. Yeah, yeah let's have an example. Because I'll just yeah. explain to people while Nick's getting that it's kind of like a sex, a sacred geometry put with sacred, sacred standing stones and sacred well old circles, which again are all set out in geometric patterns. So it also goes together very well. Yeah, so I hope you can see this, but this. Right, I have to come back forward a bit. That's fine. Though I think you're kind of seeing There's me. But yeah. There's reflections and things. Um, do you have you have them on your Facebook page though, don't you? So yeah, all of this stuff is on my website. Oh, where's your website? Um, which that's is a, perfect. Leave it there. Don't move yeah. it. We can see. Okay, it that's good. Yeah, you're not yeah. seeing the reflection now. So that's my photograph that I took in Wales last uh, November. I was staying with some friends in Wales. Um, this is actually that light there is actually the DVLA building. <laughs> but I don't go into great detail. They're my photographs. And then this is a painting of mine, uh, which is just over there. Um, and I've, I took a photograph of it. Well, I always, take, always photograph my work. Um, and so I superimposed it on the top. So that's one example. Another example is of Canonish stones. Oh, one of my favorite sites. Yeah. This was on so your that, Facebook page today, which I was giving it lots of likes. This one, this one specifically wasn't. This is an oh, earlier one I did a yeah, month or well, so. I've definitely ago. seen that one. Yeah. But the, the, the latest one I've done is a five and a half, six foot print. And it, the, I framed that today and it's on my Facebook page. I posted it this morning. Um, so that's when you can see the way I've kind of put some geometry, all this geometry and some up in the sky. sky. But, I, you know, I can... These don't take me three months to do, you know, and I'm quite enjoying kind of doing one in a couple of days. This is another one. This is actually a multi Uchaf stone oh, circle yeah. in North Wales. Okay. Um, you see the silhouetted stones with the Welsh in the background. And then this is just a superimposed drawing 
that I've copied and pasted on top. I mean, there's, it's Photoshop and there are multiple layers. It's very complex to do. It's not a straightforward thing. I have to think about it. So, but it, it's, it frees me up for, for you know, um, for doing so sort of slightly more interesting things, I think. And uh, what's your my, website? Uh, www.ncope.co.uk. So ncope.co.uk. So um, a lot of my new work is up on that, on the first page you go to. Actually, the first picture up is the big Canonish picture. I put that on my website a couple of days ago. So, um, but I've recently framed that. It's way too big to show you here. <laughs> um, but um, well, I'll show you it on your website would be good. Yeah, it's on my website. And um, so, we get so this is another one. One. Uh, that's it. That? Got it. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Oh, up a little bit. Yep. That's it. Perfect. And that's, a, uh, that's another Welsh beach with more paintings and um, lots of geometry. And then there's another one here. <gasps> the pyramid. Yeah, the pyramid with it, and completely unintentionally, there's an eye in the middle. <laughs> so it's like on the, the American money where you get the pyramid with the eye. So that's, that's a taster of my kind of more recent work. Well, hopefully um, people will go to your website and uh, obviously they can buy your artwork if they're interested. Yeah, the work's um, available to buy. I mean, they're prints, so which is quite easy and they're not that expensive. Um, and the price is on the website for one printed, say, 12 inches, 11 or 12 inches across. Um, I can't remember what the price is, 60 or 70 pounds or something. Oh, people is, can find that out. Great. Yeah, yeah. I've also um, started a, a Saatchi, um, saatchiart.com um, shop. So basically, Saatchi has started this website where you can, you can join for free and you can put your artwork up. Um, the price is there a bit more, but if people want to see my work, they can go there as well. Just search for my name, Nicholas okay. Cope, and you'll see all my work. The best way to go is to my website, though. Yes. Because if anybody wants to buy one, that's way cheaper to buy it <laughs> off me. Because we don't have to give Saatchi 45% of it, whatever. So, which I, I kind of resent. But. And we need to support each other, support each other's work. And, you know, all us people that are doing things for ourselves and individual yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be putting stuff up about the exhibition. Um, the, the, yeah, the, In May. the one that's planned um, to open sort of 6th of May. Um, I, I'm not sure yet. I think the, the church themselves haven't decided on their policy. I, th I mean, anything can happen. The government could shut down all public places. So um, let's hope not. <laughs> let's hope let's not. Hope it's all let's over by not. then. Well, no, it's not going to be over with by May. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. But, um, you know, I mean, I could either have it extended or I could maybe postpone it for the autumn. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I haven't decided yet, but wow. if, if people look at my Facebook or my website, the information will be there. And your Facebook's um, Nicholas, just Nicholas Cope, isn't it? Just Nicholas Cope. Yeah, there's probably a couple of other Nicholas Copes, but um, there's the, the one of the one that's actually me is me sitting in a, like a, I've got a red sofa behind me. I'm just sitting there like this. Um, if you click on one of the three and you see artwork, then that's me. That's you. you know, if you well, see any geometry, then it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much, Nick. This is great. And hopefully we can do some more thank another you, time. Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed that that... Have we really spoken, spoken for an hour now? That's amazing. Yeah, well, over that. <laughs> well, I, 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 I did tell you I could go on all night about, <laughs> about these subjects. So um, I do feel I've just barely started. So, well, you know. We'll do another one then. I think people we would do like an update, that. Yeah. You know, more in, yeah, some various other things I've been working on. That'd be great. Okay then. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank people you, check out Nick's website and also check out my YouTube channel for things as well. We all appreciate anybody looking at our work as we have to support each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Until next time, thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Bye. <laughs>